obviously in our first conversation, we went through, again, how civilization sort of rose up out of the muck, what made it different. Um, and then, you know, you said, we're still in the shadow of Sumer. In other words, up until about now, arguably, there has been no form of social organization higher than civilization. Even Western civilization, the most recently born civilization, is the same genus as Sumerian civilization. That is, it's a parochial, it's a parochial social formation with the unifying religion and all these characteristics that we talked about: a state with taxation, monumental architecture, a celestial worldview, etc. And so let me now pivot to um, a question that's related. You know, we want to be clear on what we're talking about when we talk about civilization. Okay, we, we basically know what makes it different from the primitive, the primitive societies that preceded it. We know that since the creation of Sumerian civilization, we haven't really gone past the genus of civilization, even if we're on the cusp of doing so. But then there's this other question. We've talked about it a little bit, but I think I have sort of a better way of getting into it now, which is how many civilizations exist and have ever existed? Let me elaborate a little bit. So this issue or question has two parts, what I call like a cross-sectional part and a longitudinal part. Cross-sectional meaning taking the whole world at any given point in history. Longitudinal meaning taking one place over time. So longitudinal is time, cross-sectional is space. Um, so if we take the cross-section, the cross-sectional question would be, taking the world at any given point in time, now or 1500 BC or some other point in time, how many civilizations are there? So how many civilizations are there now? How many were there in 1500 BC? So that's one question I want to get into. I'll come back to this. The longitudinal question would be, let's take a region of the world, like China or India or the Middle East, where civilization has existed a really long time, and ask, have there been multiple Chinese civilizations? Have there been multiple Indian civilizations? Have there been multiple Middle Eastern civilizations? So those are kind of the two questions I want to get into. At any given point in time, how many civilizations are there in the world? And then in, in regions of the world where civilization has existed for a really long time, is it all just one civilization, as Spingler says, or is it actually multiple civilizations at different stages of history, as Toynbee argues? So um, let's actually start with the second question, the the over time in one place question. So as I said, in some parts of the world, civilization has existed a really long time. That's not true in the West. The West is the most recently born civilization that Spingler talks about with the birth year of 1000 AD, roughly. But Indian civilization, which is still around, was born, what would you say, 2500 BC? Well, that's for the, the, the precursor, the prequel, the, the Indus Valley, the Harappans, they go through mm -hmm. a 1,000-year arc too, 2,500 to 1,500, and the Indo-Aryans then come down on top of them, and those two fuse together then to bring in definitely a new civilization in that case, the, which I think has been stable ever since, despite what Toynbee tries to divide it into two separate civilizations, the Indic and the Hindu. Um, I, I see it as one. Uh, comes in between 1,500 BC and 1,200 Gotcha. So would you call the Harappan period the pre-culture phase in the Spinglerian framework? No, I because no, um, because I don't think there was anything in that society that was pregnant with Indian society. It was its mm. own world. This is why I like Toynbee's term satellite societies that he introduces in his final rewrite of uh, in the 70s of, of study of history. I see it as a satellite society brought into mm. being because of all of its trade connections up to Persian Gulf around the corner with Sumer, um, especially with the, the, the southernmost city states of Eridu, Ur, and Uruk, who, who got wealthy off of this interchange. Both did. Um, it very much is a satellite, just as Minoan Crete is a kind of satellite of, of the cosmopolitan, megalopolitan phase of, of Egypt. Uh, they did trade back and forth there across the, the Mediterranean. Um, and those are the two satellites of the two behemoths, all four of them comprising the first generation. Um, once you introduce what Spengler calls the Tehran cultural amoeba in the north, uh, in right. other words, Indo-Europeans and Indo-Aryans, then they come down in to probably what's already in Harappa and already dying, weakening society. They're having trouble with the floods from the Indus quite a bit. Um, Mohenjo Daro is a classic example where it kept getting flooded, 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 destroying the city. 
And every time they rebuild the city, it's shabbier than it was before. So its life cycle is already predetermined by its interaction with the Indus River. Um, so it was probably pretty weak when the indo aryans got there, uh, mm -hmm. probably through the Bolan Pass. And, uh, they, you know, it was easy prey for them, easy to conquer. But then I, I do see that the what Toynbee calls the Indic civilization, mm -hmm. and Spangler the Indian civilization, he sees one, Toynbee sees a division into the, the later Indic and the later Hindu. Um, those two do fuse together to, to create the next civilization, because that Indo-Aryan element wasn't there, um, not at all. And so... Yeah, I see those as two two separate societies. Toynbee three. Toynbee says they're three. Right. So Toynbee basically says you've got Harappan, then something like Vedic. Yeah, oh, Vedic, Indic. Yeah. He calls it Indic, Vedic. Right. And then and then Indian, or I think is the Hindu, term. Right. Hindu India. Right. Yes. Whereas you would say you would say Harappan is its own thing. It mm -hmm. Harappan did not give birth to Vedic civilization. No. In any meaningful sense? Okay. I don't think so. Okay. But it is helpful to think of it too in terms of Toynbee's model of affiliations because in a way, Harappa is the receptive female society that right. the invading Indo-Aryans are the, are the inseminating phallic aspect to it. And the two together then have the child that becomes Indian civilization about 1200 BC. When I looked at a map of the language families spoken in India, and you see like Indo-European, but you also see Dravidian. I wonder yeah, if that's Dravidian just, uh, is that's the Harappan. Harappan. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, well, the broad point here is that in some parts of the world, civilization has existed a really long time. Not the West, but India, yes. We could say since the dawn of Vedic civilization. E even since before, it's just a separate civilization. But but we can say that the current Indian civilization, at least according to you and Spingler, goes back to 1500 BC or something like that. Yeah, for um, most China and India, pretty much. Well, I was going to say, so China <laughs> too. So Ch Chinese civilization born around 1500 BC with the Shang Dynasty. Middle Eastern civilization, what Spingler calls Magian, what Campbell calls Levantine, I think was born, I don't know what, what one would say, maybe around the year 500 BC or zero. I don't know where That's one would put That's what he gives the for the, the date of the pre-culture period of the Magian 500 BC. Mm -hmm. But if you look on his chart, I was looking for like Solomon, David, anything like that, which pushes it back to a thousand. Uh, and he seems to ignore the Jews. So I don't know yeah. if that's an anti-Semitic strain or not. It, it very well might <laughs> okay. be. Um, yeah. But in any case, I would put the, the, the Jews in there uh, with the United Monarchy, with Solomon and David as the pre-cultural period mm -hmm. leading to the Magian. Because let's say you deleted the Jews from existence, there would be no Magian civilization. Exactly. And this, is a point, this is a point Spengler overlooks completely with, with his anti-Semitism. I, I was thinking about this earlier. The Middle East, and more specifically Judaism, and you could say Persian Zoroastrianism, but really Judaism in the form of the Hebrew Bible. But the Middle East broadly, Israel and the Jews specifically on the one hand, and India on the other, are the great seedbeds of the world's universal religion. Everything comes right. out of it. Yep. Um but uh, I'm just making a basic point right now, which is that in some parts of the world, not the West, but China, India, the Middle East, civilization has existed for a long time, multiple millennia. Now, following Spingler, you, John, you've described civilizations like China and India as being in a state of suspended decrepitude. Decrepitude. Long ago, they depleted their semiotic reserves and are simply recycling their signs in perpetuity. I assume you would say the same about Middle Easterns. I've heard you say that about China and India, and I assume you would say the same about Middle Eastern civilization since the blooming of the flower of Islam in the second half of the first millennium AD, or maybe going into the early second millennium. But at this point, I think you would say, you know, Magian civilization still exists, but kind of like China and India, it's not really producing, it's not really in a state of dynamism anymore. Would you agree with that or not? I've got a funny thing to recount here. I just remembered a dream I had last night. Uh, so I think of Xi Jinping uh, as, as a kind of, because I was thinking of Islam as uh, its radical elements as a fossil aspect, wanting to go back to the good old days. And I, I see Xi Jinping uh, doing a similar thing with uh, emperor worship. He's basically an emperor in disguise as a, the head of the, the CCP. But I had a dream this morning that I was hanging out with him. Uh, that we were wandering around and uh, I, I was, it was in a very uneasy situation and it was him. He was walking, he had the same mannerisms and I was trying to get him to talk to me, but there was always the threat 
of his guard, his bodyguard. Uh, they were always making me nervous. Uh, at one point, they frisked me after I asked him a question. Sometimes he would give me answers, and sometimes he would just be imperious with me uh, and look off the other way, you know, and not and ignore me. Uh, <laughs> funny dream. I, I have no idea what it's about, but anyhow, so right. we're getting back to the longevities of these. Well, yeah. So what I was saying is you've described societies like China and India, civilizations like China and India as in a state of suspended decrepitude. They've depleted their semiotic reserves. They're simply recycling their signs in perpetuity. I'd never heard you say that about the Middle East, but I I sort of assume that you would say something similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. right. So, okay. now Toynbee does not do this, as we've talked about. So Toynbee, his model says there have been three stages of civilization, first, second, third. And that Mesopotamia, China, India, the Levant, and maybe even Europe have had different civilizations at each stage. So in the first generation in Mesopotamia, he says you have Sumerian civilization in the first generation, and then a distinct Babylonian civilization in the second generation, as well as Hittite civilization in the second generation, which isn't really Mesopotamia, that's Turkey. Um, In China, you have the Shang dynasty, in the first generation. The Han dynasty is a distinct civilization, the second yep. generation. And right. then you have the third generation, a new civilization, which he calls Chinese civilization. Then go to India. In India, you have Indus civilization, which you would agree with, the Harappans. Then in the second generation, you get this new civilization, the Indic, which is the Vedic society, Vedic civilization. Right. And then in the third generation, you have Hindu civilization. Mm-hmm. In the Middle East, there's nothing in the first generation, but in the second generation, you get Syriac, which is similar to Magian. But then in the third generation, you get Iranian and Arabic civilization, which subsequently unite into Islamic civilization. That's right. Um, and then but in not Europe, until puzzlingly, until Safavi comes in around 1510 and uh, with, with the, the sudden Shia uprising. And then sort of absorbs, he says, Arabic Islam, and it's been one civilization for five centuries now, since 1500, and the, uh, the Ismail Sabafi's uh, uprising. Um, right. I, I'm puzzled by that model. I, I think Toynbee's worst model is the Middle East. I think it's a mess. Um, first of all, because the Syriac civilization is only the Jews and the everything that's on the Palestine seashore there with uh, what... You know, the Volker Vandering is the Sea Peoples. They settle there. Um, they have to fight the Canaanites. The Hebrews have to fight the Canaanites. That's all Syriac right there. But yet Christianity is not. It's the third generation coming in with uh, a religion of Credo that becomes a universal church through the Roman chrysalis. And then we get Islam coming in uh, as a completely separate society from both of these two, totally separate, and then for- reforming the boundaries of the Persian Achaemenid Empire uh, with the Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphates. I think it's a mess. Why not just take Spengler's model? It's one civilization, the Abrahamic religions. That's the, I, I like bringing Occam's razor in. You know, it's the simplest model. That's what I was going to get to. And maybe you've already said what you want to say, but I bet you'll have more to say. So, so again, like Toynbee, you take each of these regions where civilization has existed a long time, and he's always breaking it up into distinct civilizations at different phases. Um, The last example, and I don't know if this is analogous, this is one thing I want to ask you about, actually. In Europe, the first generation, you have Minoan, which I think is a satellite of Egypt, but nevertheless, it's in what we now call Europe. And then in the second generation, you obviously have Hellenic. And then in the third generation, you have Western, Orthodox Russian, and Orthodox Greek or Byzantine. And then interestingly, for Egypt and Mesoamerica and the Incas, he only gives one civilization across the first and second generations. Like he, he does not subdivide those into multiple civilizations across the two generations. So um, you contrast that with Spengler, who has a much simpler model. For Spengler, there is simply Mesopotamian civilization from Sumer through the fall of Babylon. There is simply Indian civilization from at least Vedic civilization to the present, to India in 2021 or 1921. Um, There's simply Chinese civilization from the Shang dynasty to the China of today. There is simply Magian civilization from the birth of Zoroastrianism and the Hebrew Bible to the present Islamic Islamic Middle East. It does include, though, Spengler does include the Byzantine civilization in that Magian model, which is a little odd. 
Uh, and the only reason for the inclusion, as far as I can figure out, is because they build cavern churches. Hagia Sophia mm. looks just like a mosque. Um, mm. So his his criterion for unity is not the same as Tony B's. His criterion for unity is cultural and cosmological and architectural. If the Magian begins with the first mosque as the Pantheon, uh, because under the pseudomorphosis of the Hellenic society, this is the first domical uh, religious structure. And he says it's basically the first mosque. And he includes Byzantine, which Tony says is a totally separate thing. And I think he's right, actually. O Orthodox Christianity is, is totally separate from this Magian civilization, Greek speaking. It, it just feels different. Um, it's more Western than it is Middle Eastern. Um, Interesting. So I'm a little, that's the only thing I would say doesn't work in Toynbee's model. I don't see any real need to include the Byzantine with the Judeo-Christian Judeo Islamic uh, Middle Eastern arc. And also the fact that he doesn't include the Jews in it, which is clearly pre-cultural. Um, they're sort of like right. the Mycenaeans who are the pre-cultural of the Hellenic. Um, you know, they're crude, primitive uh, under David and Solomon. Yes, they have a united monarchy, but they're basically just living in fortresses and making wars, just like the Mycenaeans are doing. Uh, and, and the Franks under Charlemagne, you know, all, these are all pre-cultural examples. They all have a similar crudity and barbarism to them. But yeah, what do you think of cultures there? It, it's there, yeah. but it's not developed. Yeah, go ahead. You have more affinity with Spengler's criterion, which is religious, artistic, and yeah. I probably do too. But what do you, what do you think Toynbee's criteria are if they're not that? They seem to be more political. They're, they're more political. Like his model for the opposite caliphate as the universal state is based strictly on the analogy, the geographical political analogy with the Achaemenid Empire, which he regards with the Persians as a universal state, yet another one uh, coming out of the very tail end phase of the Mesopotamian civilization. Um, and because they reconquer basically the same territory, therefore it's the Islamic universal state. Well, uh, as I pointed out in my video on this, the problem is that the Abbasid Caliphate really corresponds to what Spengler would call the flowering of the culture with Baghdad, Harun al-Rashid, the creation of the best Islamic philosophers, Avicenna, Al-Farabi, uh, Ibn Khaldun eventually, uh, who's the Arabic Spengler, and, it's, and all the best mosques and the Arabic art come from that period. So it can't be seen as a decline. It may be a universal kind of state because it's, it's of its geographical extent, but this is still a very metaphysically intensive culture by Spengler's definition. So that leaves, so where's the Roman Empire here? And to me, the Ottomans uh, really fit the bill better than anyone. They come in from the hinterlands, the Seljuk Turks, you know, they get invaded by the external proletariat of the Mongolian hordes. They recrudesce and survive in Anatolia. Um, 1200, 1300, then they start spreading and getting larger. They conquer Constantinople, swallow up the Byzantine uh, Empire in 1453 when they invade Constantinople with the aid of gunpowder. Um, that sounds to me, and plus they don't have any great philosophers or thinkers, the Ottomans did. They're Turks, not Arabs or Indo-Aryan <clears throat> um, Persians. Uh, and they're, they started as barbarians and they basically remained barbaric with their conscription of young boys to become what they call Janissaries, which are trained right. soldiers that they send into the Balkans to fight their wars for them. So it sounds like something the Romans would do, you know, to be quite <laughs> honest. Um, but then, Tony, so Tony B responds to this problem by saying, oh, well, but the Ottomans are an arrested civilization because of these practices with the Janissaries. They're crude, barbaric. They're not a real society. Um, so he just sort of tries to sweep them under the rug. Mm. And to me, that seems that it's almost like an intuition that he recognizes there's 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 a problem with his model of the Abbasid Caliphate as the end phase universal state. Uh, yeah, go ahead. In very crude 30,000 feet above the ground terms, I would favor a Spinglerian horizontal model where you're really trying to identify the distinctive Ur symbols or cultural artistic centers. But then I would add, I mean, I, I love Toynbee's generations. China and India and the Middle East have lived through multiple generations of civilization, the same signs, hmm. but multiple generations. And I mean, I want to come back to that. It's interesting because 
China and the West are very, very different, obviously. But one thing they have in common is that they've received a lot of external overlay, a lot of pseudomorphosis, like Buddhism in the case of China and you know Christianity and classical forms in the case of in the case of the West. But anyway, I was just going to say um, I'm much more partial to Spingler's horizontal landscape, and then kind of adding toying these generations to that. Yeah, um, I don't think not, they don't seem incompatible to me. It's not at all. Yeah. Of, you know which way you want to lay it vertically or horizontally. Um, right. This. Uh, and, all I, the you things, know, I know we've okay. discussed this before too, but we should point out that. After he published Decline of the West, Spengler realized that he had a problem because he started reading and thinking about the, the troubled second millennium, 2000 BC to 1000. And uh, he wrote some papers on it that I haven't read because they haven't been translated. But clearly it troubled him that there was something different about the Sumerians and the Egyptians versus these Indo-Aryan, and in the case of China, the same basic you know, uh, nomads with dr driving two-wheeled chariots and so forth, same people, um, not ethnically, but basically culturally, technologically. Uh, he realized that, that there, there was something different in that, like a chisora or an interregnum in that, in that second phase, but he'd already done Decline of the West, so he was going to go back and redo yeah. it like Toynbee did. Um, so he, he knew that, that there was something different, that the first civilization didn't produce philosophy, um, well, and yeah. and Gebser, Gebser articulates it very nicely, just the because it yeah. is cross it's cross civilizational, all at the same time, roughly you know seventh century to fourth century BC. You just get like this right this transformation in consciousness. It seems globally with philosophy to, coming in, yeah. from, from China across to, to Greece. China, you have the Tao Te Ching, Confucius. India, you have Siddhartha. Uh, you have. Plato and Aristotle. <laughs> I mean, all it's just well, and, and the Hebrew the and the, the Hebrew Bible. I mean, um, yes. it's the most un philosophical religious text ever written. Yeah. Yes, it is religious, but it's also very philosophical all the way through, like Ecclesiastes, you know, and stuff like right. it's yeah, that's that's philosophy. Yeah, not, a very non-imagistic, more philosophical. Right, but that, uh, that's a Hebrew yeah. bias, though. That yeah. iconoclasm. Right. That that this is the same. With Islam, the, the iconoclasm, right. you know, once again, a similar right. between uh, the Jews and the Arabs. The, That's a big reason for the Magian concept. Keeping them sense. as one group. Right. Yes. Yeah. With Christianity in the middle there. I love these questions because I always think of something new. Uh, you could you say we have the Old Testament with the Jews and the New Testament with the Christians. The Quran should be a third testament, basically, mm. in this civilization. Yeah. It, it really is three testaments sequentially. Um yeah, go ahead. I'm going to bring up Christianity in a second because I've started to have some new thoughts about Christianity that I want to run by you. Um, before I do, let me ask one quick question. Basically, I wanted to talk just a, a, a little bit about what it means for a civilization to end, because obviously, like Chinese civilization has not ended. Indian civilization has not ended. Middle Eastern civilization has not ended. They're still going, even if they're in a state of suspended decrepitude. Whereas Mesopotamian civilization has ended. Oh. Like Egyptian, Egyptian civilization has ended. Aztec or uh, Mesoamerican civilization has ended. Incan civilization has ended. Greco-Roman or classical civilization has ended. And I want to make sure I understand how we know a civilization has ended versus being in a state of suspended decrepitude. And I was thinking my way toward an answer as you were in the bathroom. I mean, okay, one way, one way a civilization can end is if it just gets its head lopped off by some other civilization. Like the, now, the Spaniards were the right. external proletariat of the, the, the Mayan Aztec and the Inca. And they right. lopped and off in one fell swoop in both cases. I think the important part or the nuance I want to add is that whether it's, whether it's the barbarians taking Rome or the Spaniards taking Tenochtitlan, it's not that the Greco-Roman sign regime goes away. It gets melded into a new civilization. The Aztec sign or the Mayan Aztec sign regime doesn't go away. It becomes part of the Latin American civilization that follows. I don't know how true that would be of Mesopotamia and Egypt, but I think that uh, Mesopotamian and Egyptian forms did help to feed multiple civilizations that followed. So I think you could make the argument, though, sorry for interrupting, No, that, no it's uh, as Toynbee sort of does with the Achaemenid Empire of the Persians 
uh, it does represent a continuation of the Mesopotamians into a different civilization now. It's, it's in, because of the Indo-Aryan element there with, mm. with Persians, uh, different language base, uh, and they adopt Arabic as well and Aramaic, and they have these different language phases. It does seem to be, um, and they're also using clay tablets and cuneiform at first, um, <clears throat> a continuation. And the art, if you look at it, uh, clearly conserves Mesopotamian culture forms in Persian sculpture and, and uh, their, their relief uh, sculpture, even though there's mm. a totally new religion in there with Zoroastrianism. But um, yeah, Are there I, I was just going to mention with Egypt, it does sort of carry on into the Greek world and the Hebrew world, both of which come out of it because of Alexander's conquests and the intermixing of Alexandria with Greek culture to form the Ptolemies. And then <clears throat> at the same time with the Hebrews also, who um, are also having these cultural influences as well to the Egypt, with the Egyptians, the, with the myth of the captivity and the Exodus and so forth. Um, but then again, there, we may be talking about, are we talking about Spengler's pseudomorphoses or are we talking about Toynbee's affiliations, which are kind of equivalent ideas with different, slightly different connotations, but the Hebrews are clearly affiliated to the Egyptians via Moses and to the Sumero Mesopotamia, Sumero Akkadian, Sumero Babylonian via Abraham, who comes from the city of the Sumerian city of Ur. Western civilization or Faustian civilization is affiliated with Greco Roman and Middle Eastern, right? And like Middle Eastern, right? It has two yeah. parents as well. Exactly. Yeah. I guess I'm just trying to define what it means for a civilization to end. First of all, tell me this. We can think of examples where an external proletariat or not even an external proletariat, just an external civilization lops your head off. So Spaniards in Tenochtitlan, the barbarian sacking Rome, the quintessential examples. But what about Egypt and Mesopotamia? Was it the same thing? Like the Bronze Age collapse? Was that basically being lopped off by, or, or being defeated by an external enemy? Or are there examples, and would those yes. be examples, and of civilizations dying without actually being killed, just dying maybe of old age or something like that, but ceasing to exist in contrast to China and India that are just going on forever. Toynbee mentions this with, with um, the, the Islamic Mughals. So you have the Mughal empire as a universal state that conquers India for a while. Then the British get in there in the 18th century. And then we have another external universal state imposed on them under the Raj. Um, and then, so they don't get rid of that until the 1950s. But once they then do, it's back to India again. There it is. Uh, it's exactly the same civilization. It's suffered through two alien imposed universal states. And I think Toynbee's right about that. Um, and it still managed to have, it manages today to have its same identity as a people. We are Hindus. We, we worship Indian gods. Maybe our ancestors do. We pretend to sweep them in the closet because of modernization, taking up industrialization and technology, nation state competition and so forth. But nonetheless, they do still have a clear identity as Indians, they're not culturally creative anymore, though, because they're not producing new transformations of their art, new transformations of their philosophy, new transformations of their religions. That isn't happening anymore. So this is what I mean by suspended decrepitude. It's become a museum of itself. Why didn't that happen in Egypt and Mesopotamia? Did In the case of Egypt, then, so what happens is with, you're referring to the Bronze Age collapse of 1200 BC, uh, and we get to see people's as an external proletariat, like the German barbarians or the Mongolian nomads vis-a-vis -vis the Abbasids. And they come in and wipe out the entirety of the Hittites, surprisingly, and uh, because even the Egyptians couldn't defeat the Hittites and all of Palestine. But the Egyptians do survive that it, uh, with Ramses III in 1180 um, by fighting them, drawing a boundary act, and then settling them in the Middle East where the Peleset become, you know, it's Palestine, it's named after one of the tribes. Uh, and the Luvians and so forth. So they survive and they create, they are the seeds of the of Toynbee Syriac society now, but also of course, the very early, early pre-culture of Spangler's Magian uh, and Egypt goes on. And it survives, I think from that point on, pretty much as e India does today, a dead museum of itself that the Greeks go and visit. Oh, you have to go to Greece. Talus, the first philosopher goes to Greece, comes back with new ideas. Uh, and so forth, it becomes a museum that one visits, uh, maybe has new ideas and comes back and fertilizes one's new society. And then so really the final lopping off the death knell of Egypt is 400 AD. 
uh, Theod you have Theodosius the Great in 390 shutting down paganism, and it can't be an accident that mm -hmm. hieroglyphic writing goes extinct between 400 and 500 AD. It's gone. Once they stop writing in hieroglyphs, Egypt is kind of a memory at that point. And we mm -hmm. have Coptic Christianity now, a new Christianity there that's based on a synthesis of the Magian with the Egyptian and the Greek uh, as leftovers, you know, fossil atavistic leftovers that are synthesized there with Coptic Christianity. And so you cannot draw the date of, of Egypt past 400 AD. It won't go. It's dead, done, and gone. Um, so India, though, and China are these kind of museum societies like Egypt was in the time of the Greeks. It's still there. Everybody reveres them as the Greeks thought they were the oldest civilization in the world, uh, but it's a dead museum. What about Mesopotamia? I'm just ignorant. Like I say, it got extended through the Persians. Oh, oh I see. On their right. culture forms. The, Hitt the right. Hittites are also into Aryan and tried to do it, but the Sea Peoples lopped their heads off in one blow. Um, 1200 BC, they don't survive. There are some Fellahin Neo Hittites, but it's it's no longer the same same thing anymore. Um, yeah. So okay, so um, once a civilization dies, its signs either become mere artifacts or they are appropriated by a new civilization. Yeah, and to become incorporated subordinate signifiers right. in a larger yeah. sign regime, kind of the way that evolution proceeded with our cells, where it took previous cells like that were free living photosynthetic cyanobacteria and then made them organelles, chloroplasts within plant cells that have a larger body and a nucleus, and they have their own DNA, but they handle that specific function from a previous age when they were the lords, you know? Uh, it's kind of, civilization kind of imitates that. This is why I like Spengler's biological analogies, because yeah. scientists really do replicate and imitate on a, on a larger scale these biological processes. No, I mean, I loved, I loved your analogy between the city walls constructed in Sumer yeah. and the lipid membranes. Li lipid or? membranes of, of yeah. bacterial yeah. cells um, in the Archean Epoch, yeah. You know. By the way, going back to what you said at the beginning about how you like to approach these materials less as an engineer and more as a musician, I remember William Irwin Thompson described his idiom as mind jazz on ancient mind jazz. texts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mind jazz. His dialogue with scientists, and he treated uh, the, the avant-garde scientists as a kind of uh, hip avant-garde that he was mind jazzing with because he, you know uh -huh. he got his PhD, I believe from MIT. He taught there anyway at MIT, and he complained about trying to teach English to uh, technology <laughs> guys. <laughs> now they were all lunkheads, couldn't get it, so we left in disgust. <laughs> and he seceded. In other words, he seceded from academe at that point. It's a perfect yeah. illustration of Toynbee. Uh, he seceded uh, at, to create his own internal proletariat of Lindisfarne, mm -hmm. you know, uh, modeled on the Irish monasteries um, with a different, you know, attitude and, and cultural DNA from the academic world as a whole. He, he seceded. Well, that was that was wise because academia is in a pretty bad situation. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> Every professor friend that I've had over the years has told me the same thing. You're lucky you stayed out. <laughs> it's, it's pretty it's pretty bad, in my opinion. And I don't mean that cheaply. Like I could go into detail about what I mean by that, but that's neither here nor there. So, um, yeah. OK, so I said earlier, like I had the kind of longitudinal and cross sectional. So we've talked a bit about who's right, Spingler or Toynbee. In a particular place like India or China, are there multiple civilizations over time? Or is there just one defined by its signifiers? And I think you lean more toward the latter answer. I do too. But that's kind of what I, what I wanted to talk about there. Now I want to switch to the or shift to the cross-sectional question, which is if we look across space, across the globe at any given point in time, whether now or 1500 BC, how many civilizations are there? So for example, how many civilizations are there now? Or in 1500 BC, how many civilizations were there then? The horizontal question. Now, my favorite place to start here, at least if we're talking about the present, is Campbell's signatures of the four, of the four great domains, which I think is the first chapter of volume Oriental two mythology. Of mass yeah, volume two, yeah. Oriental um, Okay, so Campbell says there are it's really like two great domains and then two subdomains within them, right? You yes, have that's right. you have the Orient and the Occident, 
the Orient subdivides into China and India, and really we should say India and China because India is primary um, in a sense. Like it, well, actually I should not say that India is primary. That's the wrong way to put it. But there's been more, like India has done more, it has exported more of its signs to China than the other way around. Similarly, uh, the Occident subdivides into the Levant and the West, I guess. Um, And there too, the Levant, has transported more of its signifiers to the West than the other way around, I think. Although maybe that's changed in like the last couple of centuries, but, um, yeah. but um, so I, I like that basic framework. You've got, you've got the Orient and the Occident, more specifically, you've got China, India, the Levant, which again is like the Middle East and the West. And what Campbell argues is that the Orient and the Occident there is a profound difference between the Orient and the Occident. So in other words, China and India on the one hand have something profound in common that distinguishes them from both the Levant and the West. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, China and India also have a profound difference between themselves. Yes. And the Levant and the West have a profound difference between themselves. That's right. Um, So I thought that maybe the first thing that we could talk about is the content of those differences. What is it that distinguishes the Orient from the Occident? That is, that distinguishes China and India on the one hand from the Levant and the West on the other. And then we can get into the subdivisions. What are your thoughts, either your own thoughts or your understanding of Campbell's thoughts of the difference between the Orient and the Occident? Okay, Uh, very, very interesting question here because I, I do think that the Orient as you say, comprised of India and China, uh, taken as a whole, which would also naturally include, you know, satellite societies like Japan and Korea and so forth. Um, but but they do share something in common that makes them very different from the West, starting in the Middle East with the, the Levant. Um, some of these terms have obviously fallen out of fashion, Orient, Occident, Levant. Nobody uses those terms anymore. But uh, Campbell set this up in the 1950s when he was writing his magnum opus, The Masks of God. Uh, which is his best work, uh, surveying this and traveling. He was also traveling through India and Japan, uh, writing this and comparing the differences between them. So what they have in common is a few few things. Number one, there's a certain formality about the society. And this was off-putting to Campbell when he was in India. There's a certain formality. Oh, I'm just doing my duty. You would thank someone for giving you I don't know, something extra at the cash register or, or whatever it is. And they just say, oh, no, don't worry about it. This is my duty, my dharma. And it was off-putting to him. Um, so there is a certain sense in which the individual in those societies sees him or herself as more of a function of the social order than a true individual, than a true individual with depth. The way that the West has, the West, on the other hand, from the Levant all the way over to Europe has developed uh, the sort of n- the nuclei, the hard, let's say what Peter Sloterdijk w- would call it, the, the hard self, the, the transcendent self, um, where, where there's a sense of individuality where it's like, don't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do, not what society expects me to do. So there is that emphasis where in, in the East, you do what society expects you to do. And that's just the way it is. You know, there's no such thing as an individual path. Um, but in the West, it's, it's all this rebellion, 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 like with Prometheus, you know, Zeus can do as he likes. Fuck him. That's the attitude of the West with, with individuality. So that has led the West onward into one innovation after the next. You can already see it in the Iliad. Uh, it's announced right there in the conflict between Achilles and Agamemnon. Achilles is this kid, this blonde, beautiful Brad Pitt, 20 year old versus Agamemnon who's like, you know, Mel Gibson at the end of his career, uh, like, in his <laughs> six, like in his 60s, let's say. And so, and the two are fighting. And uh, ostensibly over a girl uh, taken as a captive, Briseis, but, but that's not the issue. The issue is the new kid on the block here has new ideas. We Greeks don't follow the traditions of the Persians or uh, anything East. Well, we've got a new thing here, and it's called individuality. Um, that's the conflict. It's already announced right there in the Iliad. And it, it, just the West with Aeschylus' Prometheus, Prometheus uh, bound, uh, Zeus can do as he likes. Same attitude. It, it just goes right down. 
Uh, not, that's not the case in, in India. And if you look at their, one of the most and best Chinese novels is The Journey to the West, which recounts a Buddhist monk going to India to get Yogacara Buddhist texts that are sacred and that they, they want. And so it takes them forever to get there. And there's a kind of fantastic four. There are these three guys with they're accompany him with all these different superpowers. But the one guy, Monkey, as he's called, um, the novel opens right up with Monkey just being, you know, irascible and upsetting the social order everywhere he goes. He goes down into the realm of the sea with the dragon kings. Uh, he upsets them, the Jade Emperor. He goes there. there. He steals Latsu's elixir, drinks it down, the elixir of immortality. Um, all these revered figures. And, you know, he's just behaving like a Westerner, in other words. So the, the answer to, to that irascible clockwork orange Malcolm McDowell type behavior, which is a similar response in, in that movie and in this novel, is to put a cap on his head, which binds him and prevents him from uh, doing what he wants. Now he has to follow the group now. He can't, he can't behave chaotically. And so that's the Chinese response to this sort of Western emphasis on the individual can do as he likes. We don't do that here in China. We don't do that in India. Uh, we follow the social order. So there is that difference in the way that both uh, the Orient on the one hand and the Occident on the other regards the individual subjectivity. So this would be the interior response, the, the, subject, the subjective response. Now I'll finish with one more point, which is that Jish Jen wrote a book called The Girl at the Baggage Claim uh, recently, about maybe 10 years ago, some, something like that, where, uh, so uh, U.S. officials are going to get this girl who's a talented Olympic athlete, whatever she does. Um, they, they go to the airport to pick her up, and instead they send her sister. And uh, the, the, the U.S. officials are like, well, we wanted the girl who has the abilities. And the Chinese are like, well, we sent your sister, her sister. What's the difference? What's, what's the fucking difference? What do you mean, what's the difference? is the West response, very different ideas of subjectivity. And just Jen then says, well, the thing about the, uh, the Asians is that we have this concept of the flexi self. Uh, different painters can sign each other's canvases. One painter might make a, a, an image and have another guy sign it. What difference does it make? Um, well, in the West, it fucking matters whether Rembrandt put his signature on this painting or some other guy did. It matters. Why does it matter? That's the thing they never tell you when they're looking for the genuine Rembrandts. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because it's part of the Western metaphysical conception of subjectivity, that the self is uh, a kind of a species unto himself. And we love that. We love these individuals like Leonardo and Goethe, Rembrandt, on down the line that are like worlds unto themselves. The Asians don't think that way. You're overvaluing the individual. We have all, what do you mean? Who cares? We have all these uh, macrocosmic processes, the Tao moving through everything. That's what we like. And so the, the metaphysics of the two domains are very different. I'm reminded of the Scandinavian guy who says, I built this and we separate the I from the yeah. verb. Borkenau's yeah. essay is very Borkenau. related to this. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Uh, the, the earliest signature on that Scandinavian horn I, for Gelmer, made this horn, and this is 400 AD, and Borkenau identifies it as the beginnings of Western subjectivity. It matters that this guy made this artifact. It starts mattering, and it, it starts with the Scandinavians thinking this way, Scandinavian culture. It matters who made this horn. You know why? Because I'm going to make a better horn. I will make a, a better horn. Uh, I, Siegfried, let's say, will make the better one. So there becomes competitive and then it reiterates that Greek agon uh, where the Greeks invented this idea that excellence is found through competition. It might be philosophical competition. It might be athletic competition. It doesn't matter what the competition is. You find yourself through competing with, with another guy. That's how excellence is made. That's in the West. In, in the East, it's different. In the East, it's always groups. Uh, the, the Mahabharata is about the, the five Pandava brothers. They are a group. In the mm. West, if a Westerner wrote the Mahabharata, it'd be one guy, one guy there. In Journey to the West in China, it's four guys. It's the group that matters. In the West, it's Achilles that matters. It's Parsifal. 
it's Faust, it's Hamlet. Each one of these guys is a world unto himself, not part of a group at all. So yeah, once again, the metaphysics of subjectivity are totally different in the in these two domains. Yeah. And Beowulf, another good example, right. kind of early, yep. very early West, proto West. Um, okay, so the question naturally arises, okay, why did the Orient go in this direction, the Occident in the other direction? And I'm not going to find exactly the right words for this, but the fact that going back to the Jews and maybe before the Jews, maybe back to the Zoroastrians, maybe before that, there was this cleavage between creator and created. Um, whereas that macrocosmic vision never arose in the Orient. And maybe that's the wrong way to put it. But in other words, the macrocosmic vision is of unity in India and China, whereas there's this fundamental polarity between creator and created. And the created is always seeking to return to the creator. If I remember correctly, Campbell seems to think that that's really where the paths bifurcate. That's what leads to these differences that you've laid out in subjectivity and the importance of the individual. Does that ring a bell or does that seem- it does. Yeah, accurate? yeah, because in the Old Testament, we have that. Uh, with with the the God, the God being who then creates something that is an object. He's a subject, and this is an object: the the earth, the world, Adam and Eve, whatever. Um, they're two separate things, and there's a tension there between them. One way of capturing this is that God is both transcendent and immanent mm -hmm. in the Orient, but God is only transcendent in the Occident. He is not immanent. That's right. And we the and we the created. Are basic, we spend our whole lives striving in vain, ultimately, because God is not in us. We're trying to attain to that height. But of course, it only comes according to some of our religious traditions in the afterlife. But yeah. my main point here is that I think transcendent and imminent orient versus just transcendent occident is one other way of putting what I said, but continue. Yeah. And, and then contrast that then with uh, one of the primary and oldest myths in India in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad of the cosmic self. It's just there, and then it splits like mitosis into two entities that are a male and a female, and they go through transformations of animals, their bulls, their horses, and their matings create everything down to human beings. And then at some point, the guy becomes enlightened and says, oh, I am all this. I have poured forth all of this out of me. Everything is one. Everything is Brahman, one single field of humming vibrating cosmic energy. And so really, yeah, there, there is no sense in which the creator is separate from the creation. The creator's imminent, the creator's in all of this. Everything you see is God. Everything you see has come from God. Everything is the same substance. Uh, and the West never approached that until the end of the 19th century with the energy idea. When energy started coming in, in physics, the, oh, everything is energy. And then Einstein comes along and says, well, if that's the case, we can split an atom. There'll be a lot of energy in that fucking thing. Uh, and he was right. So the energy concept then uh, it took the West a long time to get to that everything is energy. Th that the Hindus had already figured that out long, long, long ago. They just called it, they used a different word, Brahma. Same, same thing, though, same concept. So if China and India have in common that for lack of a better phrase, the group rather than the individual is primary. And the Levant and the West have in common that the individual rather than the group is primary. And maybe that's not the right way to put it, but if that is correct, in both cases, in which of the two subregions did the idea originate? Because presumably we're not talking about parallel development, we're talking about diffusion. My initial take based on reading chapter one of book two is that and I'm going to come back to this issue, that it originates in India in the Orient and it originates in the Levant in the Occident. And again, yeah. I, I think that the reason in the case of the Orient has to do with what you just said, the macrocosm encompassing self that is then split uh, versus the cosmology of the Hebrew Bible, which is a creator God and a distinction between creator and created. And, and of course, the West received that idea through the vessel of Christianity, although maybe it has independent origins in Europe as well, you know, because obviously the Norwegian horn builder was not influenced by Christianity when he said, oh. I 
for Gelnar oh. built this. But in any case, so, right. so maybe I, maybe I'm wrong there. Uh, but well, it's sort of like if, if you have a god separate from a creation, <clears throat> then you have this idea of objectivity, subjectivity versus objectivity, um, force moving the mass uh, that becomes you know over time that becomes secularized by science. Oh, it is all about forces moving mass around. That's what it is. And we can derive empirical laws from this that tell us which forces, the electromagnetic field, uh, gravitation, uh, gravity moves the planets around. So all that is consistent with a separate force that moves objects around. But in India and China, they would say, no, matter does its own thing. It's, it's there moving around. It knows what to do, and it's going to do its own thing. You just have to understand the Tao, the movement of the Tao, or in India, the Brahman. Uh, matter moves itself. There's not a separate entity from it, because the, the gods in India and in China are manifestations of the same primordial energy field. Um, they are bound up with it. They don't manipulate it. Uh, so those are the kind of the differences, the subject-object emphasis in the West and this identification of the subject with a macrocosmic force field in the East. Two different ontologies. But the question I wanted to ask, and maybe I didn't this this clearly, again? is, yeah, yeah. I mean, and maybe we don't know, but I just, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it begins in India with the Upanishads, uh, mm. 800 uh, BC in China. It, it's difficult to say because there's been so many book burnings in China. We've, we've lost so much of their material. Uh, Maybe the Shang dynasty already has this idea. They certainly have shamanism uh, with their bronze vessels and the communication with this, the dead, the dead ancestors and ancestor worship, which, by the way, is another characteristic of both India and China, is a very strong emphasis looking back at the past and worshiping the dead, the ancestors, uh, the, what are called the Petris in uh, India, uh, the fathers, uh, patriarch derived, the, the fathers. Uh, but in the West, it's, you know, we want the kid, we want Achilles, we want the wonder child, we want the kid who's going to come up with uh, the iPad in his garage. Uh, it's a totally different mentality in the older regarded as they're old, they're, but in China, uh, the old have all the values. They're the ones who have, uh, you know, if you look at all the Chinese deities and heroes and divinities, they're all grizzled old men with long beards like Lao Tzu. Um, they don't have a, even have a concept of a beautiful young man. The beautiful young man is an invention of the Greeks. It starts with their Kuros statues that were originally connected with their funerary cults. Um, here we have this statue. We'll use it as a grave marker. But wait a minute, that's a really beautiful body this statue has. And then it becomes kind of a, an ideal for the entirety of Greek culture. The beautiful man with the, the washboard stomach. And that's what we want. The kid, the young guy. Totally different from India and China. So the differences between the West and the East uh, um, can be characterized in a number of ways. The, uh, those are better terms than Occident, Orient. Edward Said's book, Orientalism, pretty much killed and deconstructed the use of the mm -hmm. word Oriental. We're not allowed to use that anymore. It's deconstructed because it's colonial. It's intellectual colonialism. Um, but Campbell was using it back in the 1950s in a naive way before you know Edward mm -hmm. Said came along. Uh, so yeah, so those are some of the fundamental differences. And I think that the ancestor worship is a, is a big deal in both India and China and not in both the Greco-Roman and the Western Faustian. It, it's, we could care less. We have cemeteries that are out beyond the bounds of the city. If you want to talk to your dead, go talk to them. And not only that, but the West has the shortest day of the dead of the year. Halloween is a joke. It's not even a holiday. It's a couple mm -hmm. of hours after dinner at twilight where the dead come to us in the form of these kids and we give them treats to make them go away. So we don't have to deal with the, the bite of conscience that they represent. The mm. whole thing is a festival of getting rid of the dead. So we now can proceed with our suburbs and skyscrapers and we won't have to worry about them. We, we gave them treats back in the old world in the, in antiquity. Uh, and the Greeks had a lot, they had several festivals of the dead and you would honor the dead by giving them, a favored goat, a favored cow, whatever you had. It wasn't a candy bar, uh, but it was something that was precious to you that you offered to them. Therefore, I've appeased them. Now we can continue with building civilization now that the dead are out of the way. In China, the dead are never out of the way. They're integrated yeah. in the society. 
Ancestor worship and filial piety is absolutely fundamental. Read Confucius's Analects. The whole thing is a peon to uh, respect for the dead, respect for your elders, respect for your grandmother, your grandfather, um, that kind of thing. It's totally different mentality. One, but one thing that's interesting here, though, is that everything that you're saying about the difference between the East and the West, when you talk about the West, you're only talking about Europe. You're not talking about the Levant. And of course, it kind of makes sense. In fact, regardless of where the ideas originated, if we look at society today, China is probably the clearest example of the group rather than the individual being primary. Like China seems to represent that to a greater degree than India. And similarly, Europe and its settler colonies seem to represent the idea that the individual rather than the group is primary to a greater degree than the Middle East, right? So, Even more um, so yeah. yeah, and like I, like I have not heard you give one example of the individual mattering in the Middle East. It's all been in reference to Western Europe. But yeah, course, because it's, it, yeah, with the Middle East, it's, it is a middle ground there uh, because we have Christ's statement. Um, when two or three are, of you are gathered together, there am I in your midst. But we need those two or three. Um, so, no, in, in, the, in the biblical world, I don't think they've discovered individuality like the Greeks did, for instance, or, or our Western European. Um, it's still kind of in transitional, in a transitional state. Um it is different from the way it is in India and China, um, but it is still group-based because all of these, Oswald Spengler points this out in the decline of the West, that we have nation states. The Greek had city states. The Greeks had city states, and in the Middle East, they had consensuses. Yeah, everyone has to be on the same page. We all believe. We're believers. That's what unites us as a group. Um, so there is still a group emphasis in the biblical traditions. Uh, so that's important to remark on that. Yeah. I mean, I think that Campbell thinks the creator created division is quite central. And if that's true, that did originate in the Middle East. But it sounds like there were independent strains in the Greco Roman world and in the Germanic world, independent individualist strains that took individualism to a different level, maybe just completely independently of the Middle East, or it led Western Europe to put a more individualist spin on Christianity, which is of Middle Eastern origin. Anyway. Um, uh, we should point out yeah. here now that I just had a thought, which is that um, you're looking for the earliest manifestations. And I think we can go back to the first generation with the Mesopotamians uh, with, in between Tigris and Euphrates and the Egyptians. And I think we can say that the Asiatic mentality does come out of Egypt with the ancestor cults, the worship of the dead, the cult of the dead, uh, the group-based mentality is there in Egypt. Not in Mesopotamia, though. It's very individualistic. For one thing, mm. they've got this myth that human beings were created by the gods to be slaves. So uh, you have this idea that Enki, the, the creator god, digs up mud and makes statues and brings them to life so that they'll do all the work, dig the canals, uh, sow the fields, so the gods don't have to work for a living. Let's create human beings as separate from ourselves to do that work for us. Then also in the Gilgamesh epic, the whole thing is, is a story about just one guy, Gilgamesh, traversing the cosmos on his own, looking for the answer to how he can become immortal and defeat death. It's just one guy there. Um, the Egyptians never came up with anything like that. They have a lot of really interesting short stories. The Egyptians invented the short story and the autobiography. Um, the, the, out of the, the autobiography is invented out of the tomb inscriptions. I, this or that vizier, um, am righteous before the goddess Mott, the goddess of justice and truth, because I served the Pharaoh this way. I did this. I did that. So they are already sort of in Egypt onto the idea of the ego, onto the idea of individuality. But yet, nonetheless, the, the whole weight of the culture is on the past, on the dead, on worshiping the dead. Everything's about the dead. In that civilization, therefore, it's it's past oriented, just like Asia, uh, India, China, whereas Mesopotamia, Gilgamesh is looking to the future. He wants that solution, and he'll keep going to the horizon, even if he has to walk through the constellations to get it. He'll keep going. It's future oriented already with the Mesopotamians, and I think that's where it, it starts with these with this first generation and these two uh, hmm. that launch everything and, and get it going. I was leafing through. Samuel Noah Kramer's The Sumerians today. And I real I learned that 
Gilgamesh is not just a legend. He actually was a king. That's true too. Yeah. Yeah. He was Sumer, a real guy. Which is, yeah. It's interesting to learn. Um, yep. He must have been a pretty impressive dude to have been immortalized in legend. I'm it? sure he yeah. was. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure um, everyone was in awe of him because he, he becomes like a figure that's equivalent to our King Arthur, let's say, who right. was also a real guy. Beowulf, we don't think was, but King Arthur was a real guy. Arteje, uh, he was mm -hmm. a Duke Spolorum who was trained by the Romans to fight. Um, so he, he was Roman trained. And uh, he wasn't actually a king, uh, just a warrior, uh, kind of like the, but on the other hand, with Gilgamesh, this guy was a king. He was what's known as a, a, a Lugal, uh, who is the lord over the land. And um, he, he the, one of his main claims to fame is that he built the walls around the city of Uruk. So he's a wall builder, a, a membrane defining wall builder. You only need a wall if you want to define yourself in this case, is a city-state with its own individuality against other city-states who might invade and tear down that wall, kind of like viruses do, uh, invade, get in, tear down the wall. We lose our, our gods. We lose our identity. So there is an egoic identification process there, implicit in the tradition that the historical King Gilgamesh built these walls. Um, so he's already thinking in terms of ego, his own ego and the ego of the city of Uruk itself. Uh, with that membrane. Uh, so it's interesting when you think about these historical figures, what is it that they're associated with? And that gives you a clue to what they represent in terms of their semiotics, in terms of the actions. And there's nothing in Egypt like that. There is no one guy that you can pull out, except for, of course, Ignaton, my, my favorite. But uh, Ignaton was an individualist in a certain sense because he rejected the Theban priesthood. Mm and said, I'm going to go out and found my own city in the desert, and we're going to worship our own version of the sun god, and we're not going to worship the, the gods of the dead anymore. That's in the past. He's already thinking of the future, the next generation, the second generation of civilization, which will start turning its back in the West, start turning its back on cults of the dead. That's what he, he's already, he's a forerunner of that development. Uh, but then, of course, in Egypt, he's anathematized this reckless individualist how dare he sin against the goddess mott truth so they struck his name from all the records um we're lucky we even found out this guy existed because they and the egyptians were very very careful about chronicling every ruler the date the reign and the, we have excellent history from egypt and they tried to to blink this guy out of existence just they destroyed amarna they wiped out all traces of his name because he was an individualist. <laughs> he was already looking forward uh, right. to the world that Gilgamesh is already also looking forward to in the West, the individual, the ego, the membrane, the boundary. These are some of my favorite people of all time. Of all yeah. time, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, this is actually unrelated. I just, for some reason, thought of it while you were talking. But yesterday I was reading about a, a historical event. And I know what the name of it is, but I'm not telling you because... I think it's probably either the most important Magian Boundary Act, or at least one of them. And I'm curious if you can guess what it is. That is Magian civilization defining itself against another. Well, the Mac through an act. Well, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's what I. That's what I was reading about yesterday. And I just when I was reading it, I was like, Oh my god, this is like the quintessential Boundary Act, and yes. more specifically. Magian civilization against Hellenic. Um, anyway, I just wanted to mention and the key, that. So, and, and keep in mind there, too, uh, it's the Maccabees. It's not one guy. It's this group, this little tribe of the Maccabees. Uh, mm. It's not one guy. <laughs> so already with, with that boundary act, right. it's, it's the group. It's, it's us, the believers, right. the consensus. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so just summarizing here. So you agree then with Campbell in a broad sense that China and India on the one hand differ from the Middle East and the West on the other in that in China and India, the group rather than the individual is primary and ancestors are to be revered and worshiped and remembered. Yes. Now, what's still not really landing with me, I can totally see how that's not true in the West. It's less clear to me that well, I think, as you said, the Middle East is sort of a middle ground between the West and the West on the one hand and China and India on the other. 
would you say that they do not subordinate the individual to the collective to the same extent and they do not revere the ancestors to the same extent as in India no. and China? Yeah, I would say that because uh, yeah. as Porcano points out, with regard to the Jews and the Greeks, both, they both turn their backs on the underworld. Uh, the underworld goes dark in both cases when in the Odyssey, Odysseus goes down into the underworld. It's very dark. It's a realm of twittering, ineffectual shades. Even Achilles is just a shadow. Uh, they're totally ineffectual. Same thing with the, the Hebrews. Uh, the realm of the dead is Sheol. They don't want anything to do with it. You just throw your dead in a cave and shut the cave and leave it alone, mm. walk away. Uh, so they, uh, yeah, there is already with both ah, the turning of the backs. Fascinating. The ancestors. This is really helpful. So when we're thinking about what makes the Middle East different from China and India, bringing in Borkana is helpful. They are not death transcending. They are death accepting. That's right. That's exactly yeah, right. Okay. And keep in mind, too, that even though I have drawn examples of uh, the group for the Middle Eastern uh, mentality, there's lots of examples, too, though, of the individual, Samson, and all the deeds that Samson does. He's, he's, a, he's an echo of Gilgamesh. So, uh, Samson, Saul, you know, David. Th there are lots of these exemplars of individuality that stand out. Uh, and when they're talking about the, the prophets like Elijah and Elisha, um, these are very individualistic men because the prophets are guys who did not go with the group. They're guys who went on their own out into mm. the woods. Amos and Hosea are the first prophets. They're shepherds. They're not living in a, in a village or a town or a city with the group. They're on their own. And then they have these visions, the Jeremiah. So they do have a certain respect and recognition of the individual, especially as a, as a prophet. Yeah, go what? ahead. What would you say to someone who said, well, aren't Siddhartha and Lao Tzu and even Confucius great individuals too? In India, with, with regard to Siddhartha, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, uh, mm -hmm. yes, he, he did go his own way in opposition to the Jains, in opposition to the, the Sankhya philosophical system and found his own path, but then it becomes a collective path after that. Once he finds the solution, mm -hmm. the key is that you, you're a Buddhist or you're not, because if you're a Buddhist, you're with us. And we are part of this group that rec that realizes all life is sorrowful. No matter what you do, no matter what caste you're in, it's all sorrowful. It's all miserable. So there is a collective blanket that he sort of throws on Indian civilization, a blanket of sorrow that you can be free from if you follow my nirvana path. I, I give you the key for this blanket of sorrow that I'm recognizing that the world is, the, the world of India specifically. Um, so it depends on where you want to put the accent here on, on yeah. these characters, where, where you want to put the emphasis. Uh, with Ignatan, this is a guy who says, um, th there's the one sun god and we're going to go out. And he's like the prototype of, you know, all, all the way down to like Jim Jones and people who found cults. We're going to go out into the desert where nobody's been before. And the temperatures are like a, in Phoenix, so like 120 degrees where I'm from. And we're going to go out there. We're just going to love it. We're going to build these suburbs. And it's just our little group. But I'm the guy in charge here. And of course, when he died, possibly from a plague, uh, the whole thing collapsed. It, it was entirely 100% dependent on him, as it is in cults, like with Jim Jones. Um, it depends on that one guy. And if something happens to that guy, the whole cult disintegrates. Um, that starts with Ignatan. It's individualism, but also the cult. <laughs> the cult yeah. comes along with it. Now, when we get, so the interesting thing becomes when we get to Carl Jaspers's axial age and we get these 500 BC across the board philosophers who are very individualistic, like Pythagoras and uh, Plato, and then, you know, Kapila in India, Yujnavalkya, the, the founder of yoga there, Lao Tzu in China and Confucius. These are all individuals. These are all guys living out in the woods. Um, in a shack on their own, or whatever the situation is on their own, they're thinking about how they're going to respond to their civilization with a doctrine of self salvation. So I'll teach you the tools. If I'm Yajnavalkya and uh, I'm rebelling against the Brahmin priesthood uh, who wants you to do sacrifices and pour butter into the fire, you don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is meditate and do yoga. And I have the keys of self salvation. Lao Tzu says, uh, no. Civilization is corrupt. Confucius has this all wrong. You just have to go out into the woods and learn about the Tao of the woods and the trees and the lakes and the rivers and things, the Tao moving through all things. So you do get 
with this generation, which Toynbee identifies as, you know, it's, it's sort of like the foreshadowing of his third uh, generation with the universal churches. Mm-hmm. But it starts with these individual guys going across the board here. Uh, that's a fascinating thing to think about, this rebellion of these one guys, individuals against these dying collective behemoths, the Sumerian priesthood, which is corrupt. Gilgamesh is already fighting that. McNaughton is already fighting the Theban priesthood, which is corrupt. Um, Pythagoras has gone off to Croton to found his own colony with his own followers. It's interesting. There's a rebellion, an emphasis on individuality in this generation across the board, whether West or East. Um, so that's mm. another thing to, to, to complicate our <laughs> yeah. oversimplifications. Yeah. You know. So that is true, but it's also true that the spiritual vision that the individuals put forward is very different. Um, true. That's, yep. They are so, regional solutions right. in the axial age. Yeah. So. so then subdividing. India and China have in common a focus on the group rather than the individual, a reverence for worship of maybe imitation of the ancestors. That's a profound, you could argue, more fundamental point of similarity than what distinguishes them, which we're about to talk about. So what is it that distinguishes China from India? Now, Campbell very helpfully personifies the differences in the figures of actually the leading axial age spiritual figures in the two regions, right? The wandering sage. It turns out, yeah. Typified by Lao Tzu and then obviously Siddhartha. Um, And then in the West, Job, who even though we think of him as like a European hero, because we all read the Old Testament in Europe, of course, he springs out of Middle Eastern soil. And he, according to Campbell and Spengler, is maybe the quintessential personified expression of the Magian or Middle Eastern or Levantine soul. So you have Job for the Levant and then Prometheus for the West. But let's start and I wish with, you'd um, added Faust yeah. in there, as you know. Right. And one thing I want to get to, although not right now, is like where Christ fits into all of this. Because it's so interesting that Christ is not yeah. like... Right. But 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 I'll, but I'll come back to that. I have some I have some thoughts about that. But anyway, let's just start. And we don't need to belabor it. I think maybe we can do it quickly this time, and then maybe we can delve more deeply in future conversations. But in relatively brief terms, the core spiritual difference or core mythological difference between India and China, as represented by Siddhartha and Lao Tzu, what's the big difference between those two that Campbell is trying to get at? Um, Campbell points out in the Mass of God, this is interesting, where he, he talks about, now notice in India that with meditation, the mind is taking control over the flow and deliberately saying stop the flow, because the original definition of yoga from Patanjali is that yoga consists in the intentional stopping of the spontaneous activity of the mind stuff. Chitta is what it's called, mind stuff. And chitta is in our heads and it's constantly moving. And it's constantly taking on the forms of the outer world that we see through our senses. And so the, the goal then is kind of like you throw a rock in a, in, in, a, in a pond and you see those ripples, that's cheetah. You want to get those ripples to just stop, to just, you want that clear, lucid surface with no movement whatsoever. China on the other hand, it's a different matter. The Tao is a constant ripple. It's a constant flow of energy. You go with the Tao. Don't stop it. Don't resist it as in India. So there's two different ways of salvation. The Tao is imminent in everything, and it has a yin-yang polarity that never lies, that, that can be found out through the I Ching and the casting of the arrow stocks in the I Ching. You are subservient to the Tao. In India, it's, it's, it's the other way around. You, the individual, get control of this. You have the power mm-hmm. to stop. Uh, so the eyes are closed. You do it by closing your yeah. eyes. Whereas to adjust the, statues, it- the eyes are closed, all of them. No matter what's going on, it might be epic deeds from the Mahabharata. The eyes are closed on everyone. Not so in China. The eyes are wide open to the outer world. So you could characterize it as China being more extroverted and India being more introverted. To roll with the Tao, you have to have your eyes open. Yep. With the yin and yang, uh, the you know, the shady side of the stream and the bright side of the stream is the yin and yang. So you got to have your eyes open to make sure you know which side of the stream you're on. Um, Whereas if you're just trying to quiet all incoming noise, <laughs> it yeah. helps to close it's the your, eyes, right? Just shut it off. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you just want to shut the um, damn thing off. 
<laughs> right. So let, let me ask, uh, if you had to summarize, summarize is not the right word, capture the East in one image and then capture the two subregions in one image. I've tried to do a bit of this. I mean, there's this great picture of Lao Tzu on his buffalo walking alongside the river. I think that's a good one. And any number of Siddhartha statues where his eyes are closed. But what about the higher level image of the East or the Orient? What do you think would be a good imagistic capturing of just the East? The thing that India and China both have in common. I guess it wouldn't be the yin yang symbol. I thought maybe it would be that because there is a unity. Like I was thinking maybe the way to represent the Orient and the Occident or the East and the West would be the yin yang symbol for the East and maybe God creating Adam for the West. But that's just, yeah. that's my relatively ignorant first cut. Yeah, of that's, it. Like, that's what would not you-, bad. you could, you could take that yin yang symbol though, with, with the polarity that has the motion for India, but in the middle is the still point of the turning world for India. It's, it's right in the middle there between those two yin yang, you know, whatever they are, they look like kind of like fish, like Pisces fish, uh, engaged a dark one that has the bright point and the light one that has the dark point within it. And they spin and motivate the world. But somewhere in the middle there is that still point that the Indians are looking for, the, the point that's unaffected by the turn of the world of samsara. So it's not a bad symbol for both, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as you say, for the West, yeah, God creating Adam, that, that's really good. That synopsizes it, and we've got it fixed for all time in our mind's eye by Michael, Michelangelo yeah. on the Sistine yeah. ceiling, showing us what happened uh, with God reaching out to Adam to animate him, um, and they're they're two separate beings, and they're not touching. Eight. They're almost touching, yeah. but they're not yeah. touching. Right? right. They're yeah. not quite, uh, but they're separate, and so yeah. the, the divine manipulates the physical in the West, and that leads to our scientific mentality. So. Pretty much everything that becomes secular uh, has been originally theological, um, yeah. almost everything. This is why Carl Schmitt, when he writes his book, the Nazi theoretical philosopher, mm-hmm. who writes his book, Political Theology, and he's a Catholic, um, it, it, it calls it political theology because he says pretty much everything in politics was originally theological. The sovereign, mm-hmm. uh, that's that's a theological idea. The state of exception as a singularity that disrupts the status quo. That's like kind of a Catholic, you know, the miracle that comes down and disrupts the status quo. Uh, so Schmidt even recognized that in, in the political. Yeah, well, I mean, there is a whole interesting literature on the origins of science in the West. Two ideas about that that are apropos of what you just said are first, this mystical idea that God's creation is intelligible. Without that mystical idea, you wouldn't necessarily think you had the ability to make sense of this complex world that we inhabit. So that's one. The second is this kind of mystical pursuit of the philosopher's stone via alchemy is a very important precursor of just the kind of dissecting, yeah. taking the world apart energy of science. Right. Um, finding that, so. uh, and the philosopher's stone then becomes with, you know, with Einstein, finding that energy that- uh, right is there in both matter and energy. They're interconvertible. Um, that becomes the grail, you know, and yeah, the grail is prefigured in the Arthurian romances, because, especially because the best of all the grail romances, Wolfram von Eschenbach's Parzival, depicts the grail as a stone, as the philosopher's stone. So he recognized that, that the grail was the same thing as what the alchemists were searching for. And this was written about the year 1200, um, so he recognized the similarity there. And then, yeah, you can trace it right down into the development of the sciences and physics as the, the quest for this grail slash philosopher's stone, the lapis. Mm. Um, it always, that, that is always what it is. And so, yeah, our whole world and everything in it was originally religious and has gradually just been secularized. I mean, we left out the most obvious example, which is astrology to astronomy. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep, absolutely. All right. So um, how about the Levant in the West? So for Campbell, the personification of the Levant or Magian civilization is Job, the quintessential figure of submission to God, to God's will. And yeah. Prometheus, who is the diametric opposite of Job in the sense that he thumbs his nose at the gods. And even defies Zeus when Zeus has sicked the vultures on him. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that corresponds to what 
we were talking about earlier. Even if you do have more of an emphasis on the individual and less ancestor mimesis in the Middle East than you do in China and India, individuality is taken to a whole new level in the West with a figure like Prometheus, where you can actually thumb your nose at the God rather than simply seeking to return to him. And then Faust goes even further, I think, as you would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what's interesting too with those two figures with Prometheus and Job is that they both maintain that tension between the created man and the creator. Um, Pr Prometheus oh, right. rebellion yes. against Zeus and they're, they're separate. There's a tension against them. Prometheus says, fuck you. But right. with Job, the tension is with God, Yahweh, um, and he can't do that. Yahweh bullies him and says, you little worm, you have to do what I say. Were you there when I created the world? On and on and on. I, I win this. And Job says, my eyes have heard, my, ear, my ears have heard, uh, or whatever, and bows. And so two different responses, but the tension is the same between the created and the creator. They, they both maintain that opposition. That they yeah. so they have that in common that, that the East is not. With, with the wandering Tao sage, he's looking to slot himself into the flow, like a surfer gets on a wave to slot himself into that wave. I, I was thinking another good symbol of China would be just a guy surfing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's perfect. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. And then in India, it's the stillness. Or yeah. as Spengler says, they have their eyes closed, the world is a dream. In, in mm -hmm. classic Hinduism, not Buddhism so much. Uh, in Buddhism, you, you you even want to stop the dream. But in classic Hinduism, the world's not real. It's a dream. It's, it's a god. Vishnu who's asleep and dreaming us. Um, so we're, we're all his dream. But we're all unified. We're all part of him. We're consubstantial with him. Just like the figures in your dreams when you're dreaming are all consubstantial with you. Because they're activated in your unconscious so they, they're made out of the same substance. Every person you encounter in your dreams is made out of your, what the Hindus call chitta, the mind stuff. It's all you. And so they say the same thing. The outer world is all Vishnu. He's asleep and dreaming, and we're all part of his dream. The West doesn't do that shit. Yeah. <laughs> with, with both Prometheus and Job, it's like, no, God's over there. I'm over <laughs> here. I'm suffering. Job and Prometheus are both sufferers but they suffer for different reasons and in different ways. So interesting how uh, in, uh, with his Campbell's signatures of the four domains that in India and Asia, or India and China rather, that um, they don't have that tension and the emphasis on suffering and sorrow. Uh, Job and Prometheus are, are in positions of really rough suffering. Mm. So the West takes that on and it becomes, it's sort of like, what, what you think in your head is what you experience in life. If, if I think I'm a loser, you're going to be a loser. You're going to have loser things happen to you because you're thinking that. And so same thing with the West, with these a priori figures with Job and Prometheus, those are there from the start. So suffering becomes the West's emphasis. Only the West could produce a Schopenhauer, let's say, for, for you know, the world is will an idea and it's all suffering for him. Uh, the same idea. Uh, in Buddhism, yes, there's a recognition that all life is sorrowful and suffering, but there's always a solution. You can shut that. There's a switch. You can just turn on the nirvana switch and just ignore it. Pour gasoline on yourself, light yourself on fire, sit there burning quietly as a demonstration in Vietnam uh, that nirvana actually does work. And it does, mm. apparently. Uh, you know, these guys are sitting there quietly burning. They're not screaming. Uh, so it does work. It's real. It's a, it's, it's a real concrete thing. Um but yeah, the two domains have that, the emphasis on Christ suffering on the cross, Buddha sitting pleasantly, quietly under the tree. Mm. Two equivalent images with totally different accents. So, Sort of pivoting a little bit. So it's obviously during the axial age that the great universal religions are born of Hinduism. Or no, sorry. So Hinduism was not created during the axial age. That goes way no. back. Buddhism. But Buddhism, Buddhism. Buddhism was created during the axial age. And then all of the great Occidental universal religions, Islam and Christianity are the biggest in numbers. You also have Judaism, but Judaism is not as much of a universal religion. No. Um, it's it's much more ethnic. It's from the second uh, generation, the, the right. previous. But what I was going to say is that it's, it's just notable that, so if there are four great world religions, Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity and Islam, it's funny that they only came out of India and the Levant. China did not 
produce any of the great universal religions, nor did the West, nor did Europe. And basically, China and the West had been more pseudomorphized by universal religions than either India or the Levant. That is, to the extent that China has a universal religion, and it's not clear to me to what extent it does, but to the extent that it has one, it's Buddhism, which originated in India, not in China. And to the extent that the West has universal religion, it is Christianity, originated which originated in the, in the Middle East. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, whereas the Levant, its universal religion, Islam, was born in the Levant. India, its universal religion, Hinduism, was born in India. I think we might predict then that in the long term, China will shake off Buddhism and the West will shake off Christianity, revealing what's underneath. And perhaps what's underneath Buddhism is ancestor worship. And perhaps what's underneath Christianity is, as Campbell would say, Germanic and Celtic mythology and all the ideas springing from that. But any thoughts on what I just said there? No, that's a a really excellent analysis. Uh, Yeah, what's underneath Buddhism in in India, uh, where it's extinct now. uh, Right. um, Because they assimilated it. They, They just absorbed it and felt that it wasn't necessary. We have moksha, you have nirvana. Same stuff, you know, so so they absorbed it. Buddha is just an avatar of Vishnu, one of his 10 avatars. Um, so they absorb it. But then, as you say, Mahayana Buddhism, when it comes in about the same time as Christianity does, about the year zero uh, or so, right in there, that first century AD, and then it gets exported uh, across, you know, into Indonesia, uh, Cambodia, China. Uh, it's all Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, that gets exported. It's a big deal in China for a while until they decide in about 900 AD to eliminate it. And they start burning all the temples and getting rid of the monks and them. So they ejected it as something they they felt that it was false, that it was pseudomorphic. Hmm. This is Chinese. It's not authentically us Chinese. So we have to get rid of it. So they did. And the West though, uh, by analogy uh, has not, has not done that. We've accepted the pseudomorphic religion of Christianity as an overlayer uh, that we never exiled, even though we know damn well underneath it are the Scandinavian and Celtic gods and divinities, Odin worship, uh, which you could say that the Nazis tried to bring back, Mm -hmm. as Carl Jung pointed out. That's one manifestation of trying to bring back the god of war, Wotan, from Scandinavian myth. But pretty much... um, And the Nazis were hostile to Christianity. but, but, But otherwise pretty much it has remained as the de facto religion in the West, coming, as you say, from the Levant. Not the case with China, though, getting rid of Buddhism, which came from India. Uh, Two different, so it's it's an asymmetry there with respect to that. But it's worth thinking about. Okay, so Christ came out of the Middle East, as did Islam. But unlike Islam, Christ did not stay in the Middle East. In fact, he's virtually absent from the Middle East, except in a few pockets. So Christ spread early to Rome and then to all of Europe. Spengler thinks that Islam is like the supreme expression of the Magian soul, right? What is Christianity? I'm asking rhetorically. What is Christianity exactly? It sprang from the same soil as Islam, but took root farther west. For both Spengler and Campbell, it's not clear how Christ fits into the Middle East and the West, right? So for Spengler, obviously he's not personifying the regions. He has Magian and and, and the Ur symbol of the cavern versus Greco-Roman and the Ur symbol of the body and then Faustian civilization or Western civilization and the Ur symbol of infinite space. So he's not personifying it, but Christ doesn't really figure in any of those Ur symbols in an obvious way, right? And then with Campbell, he's not one of the personified four, right? You have you have Job yeah. in the Levant and you have Prometheus yeah. in the West. But of course, Christ is this hugely important figure, right? And it's like not clear where he fits into all of this or how he fits into all of it. And I think Jung kind of recognized this issue in a sense because he wrote an essay, which I have not read, but I know he wrote an essay that Christ was sort of a necessary answer from a psychological perspective to Job, right? That's Um, his book, Answer to Job. That that he, yeah, exactly. That uh, because of... Yahweh's bullying of Job and making him suffer. And um, he's lost, he may have won, but he lost the moral argument. And so he, now he has to incarnate as Christ and suffer like Job suffered uh, to, to balance it. You might say in 
sort of my, my new age uh, religion. Uh, it requires karmic balancing. Um, yeah. So, but now that you mentioned this about Campbell with Job, um, maybe it should have been Christ instead of Job is what I'm wondering here. Maybe, maybe it should have been Christ as the central figure for the Levant rather than Job. Um, that would make more sense because then it would account for this, the exportation of this universal church to the West and it's firing three different societies, Orthodox uh, Christianity, which is Byzantine on the one hand, then Russian on the other, and then the far Western, um, mm. where the Irish would have been another one, but it became abortive, but it, it held for, for the West otherwise. Um, maybe that makes more sense, even though it's a, it's a kind of pseudomorphic overlay. And, and it's well, funny because Spengler has an ambivalent attitude toward this. On the one hand, he says, there's all these Scandinavian myths that are resurfacing in, in the sciences, like the thermodynamic heat death of the universe is a scientific version of Ragnarok, the, the end of the universe and fire and death. But on the other hand, he says, when the second religiousness comes, it will be like Wagner's Parsifal. It, it will be a return to an authentic Germanic Christianity with piety and so forth. So he's got kind of a, a weird ambivalent attitude toward uh, Christianity. My initial cut would be, I think that Job is good as the personification of the of the Levant because Job is Islam, right? Yeah, and submission. whereas Christ is not a figure of, sub, I mean, he is a figure of submission, but he's not sort of the distilled essence of Christ is not submission. It would be, it might be something more like justice and mercy or something like that. But, but what I wanted to say is that. Com compassion. Yeah, right. Well, Love. Right. But, but but also justice. I think viewing Christ only as a figure of compassion is sort of a, it's a misinterpretation that, that may have to do more with the sociology of the West in the last few hundred years than it does with actual scriptures. But what I was going to say is that when I think about what the West is, I think Christ is very important, mm -hmm. but the West really is a kind of amalgam of, of Greco-Roman, Christ, and Germanic and Celtic mythology. And I mentioned this to you before, because we have really important elements of, of all of these things, and not just Christ, although Christ is hugely important. Obviously, Europe is historically Christian, but even the Old Testament too is very important in the West. I mean, the notion that man is made in the image of God is very important, I think, in our development of the doctrine that human beings have inalienable natural rights. And, you know, Christ is obviously the hero of heroes, if you had to name one in the West today. Obviously, we have tons of Greco-Roman influence. That's what the Renaissance was, right? That's the sort of traditional understanding of the birth of the modern West is the rebirth of Greco-Roman antiquity. Um, and then obviously, Germanic and Celtic mythology, as you've talked about at multiple points, seeps into our culture in all kinds of different ways, but, but it really seems like we're just an amalgam and Christ is a very important figure in the sort of Western pantheon, if I can use that term. And the last thing I'll say here is something really clicked with me when I read Nietzsche's line that the overman is a Roman Caesar with the soul of Christ. Yeah, yeah. Christ is necessary, but not sufficient. If we're trying to define the Western ideal or the Western hero or something like that. Necessary, but not sufficient. You need someone who's more martial, who's more masculine, and then it's married with Christ. And it's really that, that fusion that's like the ideal. Because when I think about the kind of person I want to be, if I'm honest, I, I don't just think Christ. I think Christ married with something a little more aggressive and masculine while contained, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, interesting, that fusion of, of Caesar with Christ. Um, yeah. It's almost like a fusion of Pontius Pilate with Christ. And because those two are in opposition on the final drama of the stage, um, right. and, and Christ just dismisses him and says, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, and Pilate dismisses him and says, what is truth? To the fact man, to the man of history, the Caesar figure who makes history, we don't deal with truths, we deal with actualities and facts conquests, you know, uh, plots, conspiracies, and so forth. Uh, your world is the truth world. That's not our world. But it is interesting that Nietzsche comes along and says, the ideal would be a fusion of these two, uh, of the kingdom of heaven, along with the fact man, uh, a sort of fusion, a guy who can act and have actual pragmatic physical effects on the physical world, but at the same time has a spiritual vision that is also, that, that is equally well anchored in the truth world. 
versus the fact world and, and a guy that embodies both. I think and, that's and of course, well, attempt to solve this. Right. And of course, the overman is an individual. It's like, like a, yeah. an individual hero, right? One so, guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One guy. <laughs> Not a yeah. group, but it's just one guy. Yeah. Yeah. One last thing I'll mention, and this is what I've taken in from the very alien from this conversation world of political science, but to the extent that a major political scientist in the last 50 years in the English speaking world has taken any of these ideas sort of seriously and gained a lot of readership and influence is Samuel Huntington. Now, he's not as spiritual as a lot of the texts and just subjects that we've been talking about, but he does think that civilization and culture are really important. And that's actually a pretty uncommon and increasingly uncommon perspective in political science. So obviously, right. most people will have heard of Clash of Civilizations, where the argument is that coming out of the Cold War, where the main fault lines geopolitically were ideological, communism versus capitalism, authoritarianism or totalitarianism versus democracy. He says that coming out of the Cold War, the key fault lines are going to be cultural or civilization, clash of civilizations. And the way and that he defines- Religion matters for him, religion. Uh, where right, you're exactly. At, I mean, whether you're Orthodox yeah. or whether you're Western or whether you're Islamic matters. Uh, and I think he's dead on about that. As best evidenced by the Balkans, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. That's his paradigm yeah. case. All yeah. three religions were involved there. Yeah. Right. The Greek Orthodox in Serbia, Catholic yeah. in Croatia, Muslim Islam Bosnia. In, in Bosnia. Right? And they broke up along those lines. I do yeah, remember well, his very prescient insight about Turkey saying, Turkey will never be admitted into the EU for any other reason than because it's Islamic. The religion matters. We're not going to admit right. an Islamic society into the EU. It's not going to happen. Religion is his key variable because, right, so he yep. has the Protestant West, us, Catholic Latin America. And when I say Protestant West, Western Europe, and even to a large extent, Central and Eastern Europe, and the settler colonies, Western Europe. Okay, then you have the, the Orthodox world. He doesn't distinguish between Russia, Russia and Greek, just the Orthodox world. Yeah, it's mainly Russia, right? Then he has, um, obviously, the Islamic world, which is like North Africa and the Middle East. He has the Hindu world, obviously, India. Then he has the Sinic world. I guess he's borrowing Toynbee there. That's China. Yeah. Interestingly, he does distinguish Japanese. The Japanese world is separate from the Sinic world. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Oh, and then he has, uh, obviously, the African world. He just calls it the African world. Now, interestingly, that's not a religion. And Sinic isn't really a religion either. So some of these are religions. Some are just kind of ethno-cultural regions. Yeah. But anyway, I, I just wanted to mention for about 10 years, I was a political science student and one is not encouraged. And I'm, I'm not saying I was forced to study anything in particular, but just the discipline as a whole is not very interested in the sorts of things you and I are talking about. No. <laughs> and look, I mean, and, and, and the ways in which hard to articulate key spiritual and ideational differences between the great regions of the world might actually impact politics. But Huntington is an exception. Huntington did think that these things mattered, even if he didn't get into the details, obviously, to the degree that like a Campbell or a Spengler might. He still took seriously the fact that these are different culture civilizations, and those differences matter more than political scientists tend to think, because political scientists, whether Marxist or more capitalist, tend to just view all individuals everywhere in the world as driven by the same basic desires, or it's really class, it's not culture, right? And I just wanted to mention, it's not only did he obviously think that with the end of the Cold War, we would start to see these cultural civilizational fault lines reveal themselves. But Huntington was very skeptical. And this really made him persona non grata, almost an unperson toward the end of his academic career. But he was actually very skeptical of Latin American immigration to the United States and the effect that that would have on the US because he regards, let me see what he calls it again, he calls it Latin American, but really you're talking about mestizo Catholic civilization entering European Protestant civilization. And he thinks that one of the reasons why it's not good, assuming we in European Protestant civilization want to hold on to certain notions, for example, those enshrined in our constitution, we should be concerned about tens of millions of people from a different civ culture civilization coming into our country over a relatively short period of time. One may or may not agree with that, but that's one 
one consequence of his focus on culture civilization is that he's more worried about mass immigration from Latin America to the United States than most political scientists who are more left-leaning, admittedly, are. As they come in, and they're doing that now in a mass wave, kind of an exodus, um, is that uh, they become an internal proletariat then. Uh, they're in this society. They don't really belong here. They're not of it. They're there and they, they've got their own cultural semiotics. They're not going to give that up. No culture ever does. And so they're going to be in there in the American metabolism as a kind of lump. You know, it's just going to be like a troubling digestive thing, a thing you can't digest. You know, I, I think a huge question for the United States going forward is in 100 or 200 years, are Americans of all different backgrounds going to identify primarily as American, or are they going to continue to identify primarily something other than American? Because it is the case that if you go back 100, 150 years, a lot of the European immigrants to the United States identified primarily as German or Italian or Irish or Jewish or Polish, and only secondarily as American. But this mass process of- that no longer matters. It doesn't, um, right? It, and, it mattered and, in New York at the turn of last century in 1900, whether you were in an Irish neighborhood or an Italian neighborhood or what have you. No, it doesn't matter now. Nobody cares. You're American. Uh, and the question is whether the same will be true in 100 and 150 yeah. years. Like, um, with regard to these other entities that, with the, the Hispanic mestizo culture, with Asians, um, they, they all have different sort of cultural sign regimes. All right. So uh, I'm going to ask one more question. And we've talked a little bit about this already, but I kind of wanted to put together a few thoughts and then you can just riff on it and then we'll end. Um, So we're still in our kind of cross-sectional at any given point in time, how many civilizations are there? And, you know, Campbell identifies the four great domains. Huntington has more. He has like seven or eight, right? And the answer is going to differ depending on the point in history you're talking about. The answer would have been different in maybe 1500 BC, or maybe it wouldn't have. I don't know. But in any case, so that's the broad context, we're still talking about the cross-sectional question, how many civilizations exist in the world at any given point in time. The last subsection of this that uh, I want to talk about, I've entitled parts and holes. So I wrote down the question, what makes something part of a civilization rather than a civilization unto itself? Now, we've already talked about that with respect to England, which is Toynbee's example. How do we know England is not a civilization, but part of a civilization, namely Western civilization. So what I want to do is just very quickly, okay, there are some entities that are clearly a small part of a whole, England, right? England is clearly a relatively small part of Western civilization. But then you can go up a level. There are even larger entities or constructs that are clearly still part of a whole civilization. So here I'm thinking of Upper and Lower Egypt or the Epimethean South and the Promethean North, right? We know that those are not civilizations unto themselves. They are bigger parts of either Egyptian civilization or Western civilization. Okay, then we can go up one more level. And here, there's going to be some debate about whether to categorize something as a part or a whole, right? So Persia versus the rest of the Middle East, Iran versus the Arabic speaking Middle East, right? That would be one example. Japan vis-a-vis China. Spingler does not treat Japan as a separate civilization, but uh, Toynbee does and Huntington does. I think Huntington is very influenced by Toynbee. And then Russia vis-a-vis the West, it's interesting. Like everyone seems to agree that Russia is a different civilization. Spingler thinks it, Toynbee thinks it. uh, I think it. (laughs) You think it, Huntington thinks it. But most political scientists I've noticed don't. So you have like England is clearly a pretty small part of Western civilization. Going up a level, you have like, you know, something like the Epimethean South and Promethean North, both clearly parts of Western civilization too, but bigger than something like England. Like England is part of the Promethean North. The Promethean North is part of Western civilization. Then you go up one more level, then you're getting to the point where it's not clear whether we're talking about its own civilization or part, right? So like, is Iran part of... Magian, right? Is Iran part of Middle Eastern civilization? Is Japan part of Far Eastern civilization? Is Russia part of Western civilization? Or are these things civilizations unto themselves? And then one level above, it's like no one, I think, would argue that Hittites, like Hittite civilization or Minoan civilization, these are more clearly their own civilizations than like Iran or Russia or Japan, 
but they're still significantly smaller than the great civilizations, right? Like Western civilization or Chinese, like Hittite civilization, Minoan civilization are clearly much smaller than these larger civilizations. So I guess the point I'm making is that like, you can keep going up these levels and it becomes increasingly unclear whether we're talking about a part or a whole or how exactly to conceptualize the entity in question. So Toynbee here really helps, right? Because he has this notion of a satellite civilization, yeah. which basically yeah. which basically helps us say, okay, Japan, clearly not as big as China. We can't treat it as equal to China, but it's sufficiently different maybe that we should treat it as its own civilization, but we'll call it a satellite civilization. Similarly, Minoan, they're, they're sufficiently different from, I don't know, Egypt, that we treat it as its own civilization, but we're going to call it a satellite civilization in Egypt. Hittites are clearly sufficiently different from Mesopotamia that we're going to call it its own civilization, but it's a satellite civilization. Satellite. Um, so, so Toynbee is really helpful here. Yeah, no, with that but, concept, what, yeah. what I like about the concept is like he's saying these are many civilizations. Uh, right. This is what I like about Toynbee because he can really flesh out Spengler's model where Spengler's a bit rigid with these nine behemoths and that's all there is. He doesn't take account of exceptions, asymmetries, weird anomalies, you know, and there's always that in any system. So this is why I like trying to be coming in because what's it like thinking about Japan, as you say, uh, Japan is a satellite of Chinese civilization, but why isn't England a satellite of European civilization? Because they're, they're both island societies living separate, like the Minoans, who are living separate from the Egyptians, they're isolated by geographically by water. So they're separate geographically. All three of these societies are. So why is England part of Europe, but Japan is not, and Minoan Crete is not part of Egypt? So but these are questions that make my head spin, Brandon. What is, yeah, what is your what what is your answer to that question? You know what I have one. I'm gonna have to sit down and work on it. One of try the to reasons help. why I decided to go back to Toynbee, the unabridged version, was to get dig into these questions. The main project right now, as I foresee it, is getting through the unabridged uh, Toynbee and finding all of these nuggets and gems because that guy is a fucking great thinker and yeah. Uh, yeah, he's amazing. And so we'll find answers to these things as we go through Toynbee. Well, and Another thing, one, one last thing. Another thing I like about Toynbee is that when he's wrong, as I demonstrated with the Abbasid Caliphate, I think, which I disagree with as a universal state, he's always wrong in a really interesting way. That makes, <laughs> it's like, this guy makes mistakes, but they're really fascinating right. to think right. about. And they drive you crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I mean, I would never be so bold or arrogant as to say that Toynbee made a mistake. Who am I even to say that? I think you can. Um, yeah, I mean, one way to think about it is that Toynbee has like a higher resolution model than Spingler. Yeah. And one point I was going to make to Toynbee's credit, I mean, I love Gebser's idea of a transformation in consciousness, almost like a spontaneous mutation. And I think it's particularly beautiful when applied to the axial age. But then of course the integral, that's not very universal at all. Whereas oh. Spingler's generational model is almost perfectly universal. The West has Christianity, the Middle East has Islam, India has Hinduism. And China less with Buddhism, but close, and it had it, and then it kind of shed it. And I'm not saying Gebser and Toynbee are trying to do the same thing, but I think that if you're looking for a nice model that empirically fits the great civilizations generationally, that fits civilizations across the world over time, Toynbee's is not bad, right? Just the idea of the universal church being the defining feature of the third generation is helpful. Yeah. It's largely yeah. true, right? And, and I get the impression, I don't know for sure, but I, I think that he, he doesn't have when he starts out these three generations. It's something he figured out in the later mm. volumes because um, he changes his model as he goes along. He's writing it over 20 years. So right. that's what I'm interested in, in discovering is at what point did he bring in these three generations? Because it's not there in the original volume as I'm discovering going through it. Uh, so yeah, really and, well, and also, and one of the great things he sort of came to at the end of his career is that civilizations can follow one of three trajectories, the Chinese, the yeah. Hellenic, or the Jewish, right? Like that wasn't, yeah. I don't think that's in his unabridged work, but. It's, it's not in great, the original at all. No, it's, that's a total innovation in that final edition. Yeah. But it's very helpful. That's a very helpful. It is. It's really good. Yeah. 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 Um, yep. All right, cool. Well, uh, this has been great, John. So now we oh, definitely fantastic. have enough. Yeah. I have, I've had we definitely have enough. 
Yeah. Uh, two two um, hours worth of, of fun here. Take care. That was great. I, I had a good yep. time. Thank you very much. I did too, John. Talk right. to you soon. Okay. Stay in touch. Bye-bye.